Welcome back uh, to Piers Morgan Uncensored, uh, rather rare, in fact, unique uh, work from home edition of uh, Piers Morgan Uncensored because I am currently suffering from COVID, but we'll man up and crack on. I'm with Professor Neil Ferguson. Uh, Neil, I want to talk to you about uh, two wars. Let's start with Israel and Gaza and what is going on there. I, I've spoken a lot in the last two months about it, feeling a real moral quandary about this. In the sense, I feel that Israel is absolutely morally justified to defend itself from future attacks of the kind we saw on October the 7th, and if it has a duty to defend its people, uh, given that Hamas has said they want to keep doing it again and again and again, and they're a terror group who will clearly do that. Um, but when you see the scale of what is going on in Gaza, the displacement of well over a million people now, the, the, the levelling of most of northern Gaza, and now they're heading into the south to do the same, and the increasingly shocking death toll of civilians, and in particular children in a place where half the population are children. You know, I ha I'm beginning to have, like most people who who defend Israel's right to defend itself, a real moral qualm about the scale of, of their retribution, which is how many people see it. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's just retribution. I think it's clear uh, that Israel can no longer coexist with Hamas in control of Gaza. Uh, if anybody doubted that, then those doubts were surely dispelled on October the 7th with the most hideous scenes of violence against Jews since the Holocaust. Indeed, it seemed to me that what Hamas were really trying to communicate was their intention to reenact the Holocaust. And I think every one of us, regardless of whether we're Jewish or not, has a moral obligation to ensure that there never is another Holocaust. And those who threaten to wipe Israel uh, from the map uh, are intending nothing less than a second Holocaust. So the issue is, can Hamas uh, be destroyed, as it should be, at, at a, an acceptable cost? Uh, it's the same question that had to be asked uh, when British and American forces were uh, fighting an insurgency uh, in Iraqi cities. It's the same question that had to be asked when uh, it was Islamic State uh, that was being wiped out. And since these uh, organizations specialize in concealing themselves in densely populated urban centers, uh, it's inconceivable that they can be defeated at zero cost uh, to civilians. Uh, now, the problem for Israel is that it's damned at whatever it does. If it, uh, if it moves civilians out of the way, it's accused of ethnic cleansing. If it doesn't, it's hypocritically accused uh, of genocide. Uh, so this is a, a very, very difficult, indeed well-nigh impossible situation. And it's not made any easier when the international community and indeed the US government leans on Israel uh, to stop or pause or cease fire, because that only allows Hamas to regroup and it almost certainly prolongs the conflict. I want to add another point, Piers. This is not just about Gaza. It's also about the other areas where Israel is under attack. Uh, it's about the unstable situation in the West Bank. Uh, it's about the possibility that at any moment Hezbollah could launch a massive bombardment of rockets and missiles uh, from Lebanon in, uh, into Israel. And, and there's more because there are also all kinds of, uh, of forces in Syria that bear ill will. Uh, towards Israel. The war has the potential to escalate and grow in multiple ways. We're in a kind of lull at the moment, incredible though it may seem to say that. And my fear is that at some point in the coming weeks, we'll see the next phase of the war. A new front will be opened up and Israel will be fighting not only in Gaza, but potentially elsewhere uh, for its very survival. And I want to underline to your viewers given the very small size uh, of Israel and its vulnerability in a neighborhood where it's in, almost entirely surrounded by hostile forces, its very survival is at stake. Uh, so I think it's very important, particularly for people in Britain and the US, not to be swayed by the very clever propaganda that comes out uh, of Gaza, often uh, Hamas crafted, often Hamas authorized, which is designed to make you think there's some moral equivalence here uh, because there really can't be moral equivalence when Israel is retaliating for the appalling attacks of October the 7th. And that is a just war that is being fought right now. Is war ever clean? No. Are there civilian casualties in war? Nearly always, particularly in modern times. That's the reality 
And I'm afraid uh, we have more to face of this harsh reality because this war is only like, likely to escalate in the coming weeks. How does it end? I mean, you're a historian. You, you have covered many conflicts and wars. Um, I, I just worry about whether Israel has an end game here that doesn't just involve, in many of their eyes in the leadership, just taking over Gaza, for example, occupying it completely going forward. Do you see anything other than the, that happening? Well, there's no great appetite uh, within the Israeli military for an occupation of Gaza because they have bitter memories of, uh, of what that was like before and indeed what other occupations that the Israeli army, the Israeli Defense Forces have, have carried out in the past. But who has a better idea at this point? It's a little difficult to imagine uh, the dust settling and a new uh, force emerging to take the place of Hamas that isn't just as bad. It's not like the Palestinian Authority is about to be put back in charge of Gaza. Everybody knows mm. that Palestinian Authority is an oxymoron. Those two words no longer meaningfully belong together. There are some other options which I think need to be considered. Uh, after all, what's the United Nations for if it's not to send blue helmets into dangerous territories where the alternative is ongoing conflict. And that seems to me to be the kind of thing that should be under much more serious discussion at the moment, internationalizing Gaza. Uh, that seems the kind of uh, end game that would make much more sense to me than an Israeli occupation mm. that would almost certainly just become a, a succession of, of terrorist attacks and, and countermeasures. Yeah, I agree. Um, just want to turn briefly to Ukraine, because obviously Ukraine ha has almost been forgotten at the moment at a very worrying time, if you're President Zelensky, with uh, American financial support for their military endeavours, looking like it's pretty perilous in terms of future uh, financial input. Where are we with this Ukraine war? Is it, as some people fear now, inevitable that there will have to be some kind of deal that involves Putin swallowing up some, if not all, of the land that he has barbarically stolen. Well, Piers, 20 years ago, I, I wrote a book called American Colossus, and I argued there that one of the problems of American power is the attention deficit disorder that kicks in, usually uh, after a couple of years of any engagement. And even when the engagement isn't one that involves American troops in the front line. And sure enough, American interest has been on the wane uh, in the course uh, of the last uh, several months, to the point that there are real question marks over the continuation of American aid. And American aid is pretty crucial, uh, both militarily and financially. In the, U in the European Union too, uh, as well as in the UK, one has the sense and a Ukrainian friend said this to me yesterday, that people's interest has just wandered. My friend was saying that the CNN operation in Kyiv has been relocated to the Middle East as a kind of symbol that a new story is in town and the old story is no longer really getting the ratings. This is very concerning for any friend of uh, Ukraine, and I consider myself a staunch friend uh, of Ukraine. I've been to that country almost every year for the past decade because the scenario isn't inconceivable that they could lose this war. The Russians are amassing firepower. They have greater raw resources. They have the capacity to launch an air war against Ukraine uh, in the coming weeks that could paralyze Ukraine's uh, electricity system if it's successful. Uh, and so it's not so much that there's going to be some nasty compromise deal. I don't think uh, President Putin's interested in negotiation. He's playing for higher stakes because he senses that the politics in the West is going his way and he has a shot at victory if he's patient. And that's the thing that really concerns me. We sort of lost interest. We're focused on the next war, the next shiny bright object. And while we're not paying attention, we could see Ukraine defeated. And Piers, Piers, mark my words, if Ukraine is defeated, that will send a signal not only to Putin, it'll send a signal to Xi Jinping in China, it'll send a signal to the Ayatollahs in Iran, it'll send a signal to Pyongyang, to North Korea. And the signal will be the West is weak, it cannot sustain its commitments, it can't even hold uh, Ukraine up in the face of a Russian attack. And that will spell the beginning of a very dark age in which the 2020s will start to feel an awful lot like the 1930s. So the stakes are extremely high and I urge people, do not lose interest in Ukraine. It is vitally important that Russia not win this war.
Absolutely. It's about freedom and democracy. And we used to go to world wars to preserve and defend that. And it's terrifying to me to see so many people who are prepared to let Putin take what he's, what he's stolen.